As a teenager, one of my favorite bands was the Tennessee group Paramore. To no one's surprise, this fandom was partly motivated by my being one of millions of people who fell in love with their frontwoman Haley Williams. But of course, the music was the ultimate factor. Each member of the versatile rock outfit has been deeply talented, at least with technical ability, often with songwriting too. For this reason, it shouldn't surprise us as a culture that Paramore has endured for almost two whole decades, reinventing their sound and growing with their audience, while still retaining the youthful exuberance that propelled them to stardom in the late aughts. They have a new album out this year, called This Is Why. Their lyricism has always been mature, showing wisdom beyond their years, but this album, their first to be released with the members in their 30s, feels their weariest. They're cranky and anxious and insecure. They write about social media doom scrolling, disgust with humanity, and friendships turned into inevitable romance. But there's one song that strikes me as something not only I can relate to, but as something profoundly relevant to the experience of becoming an adult and to the common discourse about it. That song is called Running Out of Time. You know, I think a lot of people just have general anxieties and I have this as well about like <laughs> what I'm going to do with my life before I die and why I'm doing anything at all if I die. And it's like this weird thing, right, where it's like I've read a lot of philosophy about why death is not necessarily bad and why you can still find meaning in life, even if it's absurd. And it's like I know all of these like arguments, but it's just like the uncertainty of this end it's just something that people can't reconcile in their head even if they know rationally like oh maybe it's not that bad so that's something that i think a lot of people like myself deal with also just things like even past like my own death like dying in my bed when i'm 80 will i even make it to 80 in toronto this summer there's been a lot of air quality warnings because of a bunch of fires that have started here and it's crazy because for the past few summers, there were a lot of forest fires in the West Coast in Canada, but like us over here in Ontario didn't really have to worry about it. But now it's hitting us and it's like, OK, it's only getting worse, but it doesn't feel like the solutions or the drive to change anything about the environment is really heading anywhere. So that's not fun. <laughs> I'm definitely trying to work on this, but I definitely am not someone who's good at living in the present. I feel like I tend to live a lot ugh, thinking about like past things or longing for past things, worrying about things that happened in the past and then how those might affect things in the future and what I should do in the future and who I'm going to be. Yeah, I don't think I give myself much, uh, much time to really think about what I'm doing in the present. And I think that comes with like being someone who's trying to like accomplish goals and be a better person and whatnot it's like you're always trying to think about like what you can do later on in life um and you're always like planning ahead but there's not much yeah same thing with like being someone who has like these like goals i feel like i need to complete in life it definitely feels like oh i'm not gonna have enough time to do everything i want i sometimes have these big dreams of like one day having a world where housing is affordable and like you know maybe people don't have to live on the streets and things like that and obviously like i I can't do that as one person, but it still feels like all these things that I want to see happen in my lifetime just like won't. And it gives me like a lot of anxiety about the future and how I'm going to spend my time when I have so much limited time to like delegate. So our past few videos have been about young adults infantilizing themselves. It's a bit of a series we've done. That phenomenon that seems to be occurring culturally of young adults ostensibly avoiding growing up. But what does it mean to grow up? And on that subject, is there actually something really bad about it that's like actually worth avoiding? I talked to four writers and content creators that I knew about their experiences with adulthood and generally how they've made sense of growing up and getting older. Ultimately, there was kind of a shared feeling that being an adult and becoming an adult is a messy experience, but ultimately rewarding in a lot of ways. Welcome to the real world. It sucks. You're gonna love it. <laughs> Responsibilities seem impossible to keep up with, but acceptance can come as a warm, healing light during the darkest of times. 
When you begin to accept your age, your fallibility, your limits, your flaws, you find something akin to happiness. This seems to be Haley Williams' intended message with running out of time. At the album release show in Tennessee, she noted that it wasn't that deep, and it was basically a song about her being late to everything, but that we can make it deep if we wanted to. So don't mind if I do. Running Out of Time is a lighthearted song that recounts classic experiences for people living all over the place. The protagonist simply can't find the time to follow up on her promises. In the first verse, she forgets to bring her neighbor flowers. She can't bring a gift to a party. She barely walks the dog. She neglects to write a condolence letter for someone. The pre-chorus is a dawning. Intentions only get you so far. What if I'm just a selfish prick? No regard. The second verse is about excuses, which feel responsive to the harsh self-questioning. I was just so tired. There was traffic. But soon it dawns on the speaker that these are only exaggerated excuses. Pre-chorus comes back. What if I'm just a selfish prick? No regard. The bridge gives us something of a happy ending. The protagonist drags her feet. Why we gotta be in a rush? But ultimately, novelty shows up on time to something. Here's growth. And yet this momentary tension sticks out like a strand of gray hair on a bleached red shag. Its follow-up on the record, C'est Comme Ça, therapizes Haley's deeper issues with avoiding structure. C'est Comme Ça, C'est Comme Ça. But it stays in the realm of the personal, as Paramore are wont to do lyrically, despite the harsh reality that Running Out of Time is not just a personal song. Running Out of Time is approaching a social commentary. To Paramore, it's about Haley, her struggle to get it together, her journey towards dealing with her own issues so that she can be a better person. I saw an interview with Dolly Parton and she was like, I hate when people are late. And I was like, no. To me, it's about time. Shocker. It's about the improbability of human beings wielding their time efficiently in a deeply inefficient social structure. Here's what I mean. I get a sense that most of us could listen to Running Out of Time and relate to it. I don't know the guy who says, I don't get it. Why doesn't she just use her time better? Or the lady who's like, time management's easy for me. I am always early and prepared. Even if those people are objectively always on time and prepared to the rest of us, the common pseudo humble response is to say that you could do better and you wish you would actually, a lament. We may be on point most of the time, but we remember that one time we didn't bring a gift for our friend on their birthday and we saw that look on their face of brief sorrow followed by a kind-hearted acceptance that let us know that we should be ashamed, but they're letting it be for that moment. I don't personally relate to that because I never bring gifts to birthday parties. We don't spend enough time though on the question of the bridge. Why do we have to be in a rush? What takes up our time? It's impossible to be a Paramore fan, a follower of the band's fascinating journey from teenage Tennessee pop-punk powerhouse to grizzled eclectic veterans, a knower of the band's troubled history with interpersonal fallouts and religious politics, an understander of Haley Williams' traumas, ambitions, and conflicts with vigorous socialized misogyny, who listens to Running Out of Time and does not think, girl, of course you're always running out of time, your life is insane. Don't stop at parasociality when you get there. Use it for analysis. What have you been through the past few years? What type of shit did you have to internalize in childhood? And is there really anything super unique about that? You may not be a celebrity or a rock star or a mega talent, but your life can still be insane. Yet if your life is insane, what does that say about everyone else's? I'm like freelancing now. I'm also kind of excited to take a break. <laughs> I've never not worked. Like just having like two days off a week. Or I had like two weeks where I did nothing. I was like, this is nice. <laughs> you said you've never not worked since when? Like since like you were out of college or like, so it's been what, like eight years of- It's way more than that. Probably like 12 years of working. Since you were 18? Yeah. I used to do either tutoring or freelance photography. Why? And then I worked I worked in store, putting the price tags on clothes and putting on them on the shop floor. I worked at a call center. I worked at Kidzania. So you've been doing jobs, jobs like part-time <laughs> here, job full-time here. Um, why? <laughs> I guess I was a child, you know, I'm a third parent. But also life's just expensive. I think when you're under 25 in the UK, you don't get paid that much unless the company is like a living wage company. So you could be getting something stupid like three pounds or four pounds an hour. 
well, back in the day, I don't know how it is now. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, it was just pennies. We were getting pennies. I slept for 17 hours the other day because I was so tired and I accidentally missed a dinner. I thought I was taking a nap. I'm not going to lie. I got in bed. I was like, to my family, I'll see you in two hours. Woke up like five hours later. <laughs> and after that, after I messaged my friend, I went straight back to sleep and I woke up the next day. But what were you doing before that made you so tired? Nothing. Nothing made you tired? How much sleep <laughs> were you getting since COVID, let's just say? Like how many how much how many hours of sleep per night were you getting? Forty four. Okay. I see what's let's see what's yeah. Yeah. It's catching up on me. Labor, labor, labor. labor Days is a 2001 concept album by then 25-year-old Aesop Rock which examines the concept of labor, work. Every lyric is a universe, I don't have time to describe it. Throughout the album, Aesop scowls at people wasting their lives on the dreams and trends of others, props himself up as the outsider artist who has chosen a path of honor, but also quietly accepts that people in power have oriented society to be this way. On the penultimate track, Nine Fiver's Anthem, he gives a famous chorus. Now we, the American working population, hate the fact that eight hours a day is wasted on chasing the dream of someone that isn't us. And we may not hate our jobs, but we hate jobs in general that don't have to do with fighting our own causes. We, the American working population, hate the nine to five day in, day out, when we'd rather be supporting ourselves by being paid to perfect the pastimes that we have harbored based solely on the fact that it makes us smile if it sounds dope. It's hard to even read fucking Aesop Rock lyrics. This chorus is one of a few times wherein Aesop Rock groups himself in with the rabble. Much of the album is dismissive towards those he sees as droning labor force followers. In this very song, he brags in metaphor of sitting atop the Brooklyn Bridge with a coke and a bag of chips, watching a thousand lemmings plummet just because the first one slipped. But by the end, he shifts from being the artist above it all to just another cog in the depressive machine. Fumbled out of bed and stumbled to the kitchen, pour myself a cup of ambition and yawn and stretch and my life is a mess and if I never make it home today, God bless. The simplicity of this part, satirically interpolating Dolly Parton's 9 to 5, is also a big change from Aesop's usual opaque lyrical onslaught. Opaque lyrical onslaught. He simplifies as the song goes on. In a way, it feels like life. A lot of us start out young, pretentious, scoffing at the rest of our graduating classes, those of us who did graduate. They're all gonna waste away, pounding the clock, but we're gonna do something meaningful with our lives. But as time passes, we grow to accept that we're much more alike with others than we think. Even those of us, maybe especially those of us who dedicate ourselves to creativity, end up having to drink our ambition with our coffee in the morning as if we've developed a nutritional deficiency. Adulthood is an experience of proving to the world that you belong. Most of the time, we prop up our labor as proof. But why? When all is said and done, what were we actually working for? Often it was to survive, to pay for sustenance and shelter, to pay for avoiding banishment from the rest of society, and then flipping the rest of our coins at whatever shiny distraction we've been given by those whose dreams we've constructed. Friends, we seem to be in a hot time for labor unions. From efforts among Starbucks workers in New York City to the dominant news of strikes from writers and actors towards film and TV industries, a gradual growth in consciousness is occurring in the United States at least towards the need for workers to unite against corporate entities hell-bent on destroying all life. Oh my god, we're catching up to the rest of the world. I'm not saying we're about to get a general national strike or that anywhere close to a majority of people are ready to engage in class warfare. What I am saying is that now is the time to analyze time. What we are told is the definitive adult experience is a ready acceptance of every bit of soul-sucking labor and social conformity demanded of us. That our time is in fact not best spent doing the things we find valuable, but is in fact better spent working and working and working. When we're not at work, we should be working on ourselves. We should be getting smarter and stronger and more cultured. Culture is a list of TV shows you're missing out for not watching, a series of idyllic vacations you're being influenced to spend your hard-earned savings on experiencing with a capital E. It's no wonder we have as such a common experience, the feeling of an existential crisis gracing us whenever we go through some type of inconvenience or make some type of mistake. Obviously it can be lovely and great to go to the gym. Gym's cool. 
<laughs> or to embark on side projects or to go to therapy, but not at the expense of a peaceful everyday life, not at the expense of having good relationships with people, painstakingly trying to outdo them instead of be with them. Of course, to a degree, we can achieve a more peaceful life by simply letting go of the constant strain, sipping less cups of ambition. We can accept our body for how it actually looks. We can take more appreciation of our neighborhoods instead of constantly embarking on lavish escapes. We can buy less and try less. But can we ever truly escape? Can we ever be free of the strains of capitalism that plague the people around us? No. Because to live well is to have good relationships with the people around us, to be there for them, to let them be there for us. And at every turn, we are instead negotiating with capitalism. We will let it take some of our time, some of our spirit, in exchange for the commodities we value, whether they be playhouses or real ones. I don't think I'm ever going to own a house, so there's that. I don't think that's fair. Like my general guiding philosophy is just I want what's best for all people. And like, I just want people to feel safe and secure in their life and their livelihood. So like having like proper housing, shelter, access to food, and you know, a chance to enjoy themselves and not work themselves to death because they can't afford to live. And that seems like the whole concept of the cost of living is just so absurd to me. Like we were born into this life and nobody has a say in it. And now like it costs money to live. And like, it's just it's so ridiculous. And like, we have the means to take care and, you know, provide for one another, at least like I'm fortunate in like in my life to have received unconditional love by my close family. And that's very fortunate, but like, that's the kind of thing I wish for all people. I wish that everyone could experience like that sort of thing because I think a lot of I'm losing my train of thought again. Yeah, ah. yeah. You become more aware of the time cost that's involved. I wouldn't actually frame it as a time cost, but you are aware of like, I could be using this time towards like doing other things, or I could be using this time for working or for cooking food or for you know, spending time with my spouse or my partner. And like, these are things that you don't necessarily have to worry about when you're younger, like a teenager, like whatever, and you sort of just kind of live and things are provided for you. And then when you go into an adulthood, you have to start providing for yourself. And while that can be empowering in a sense, you lose also that sense of innocence and sort of like naivete that goes along with being a younger person this could also be like also a youtuber thing but like sometimes like weeks will disappear at a time and i'll be like where did that whole week go and like even though i know like within the week i'm spending like all these hours kind of like working and doing what needs to be getting done like putting hours into like exercising or staying fit or into you know whatever like i sort of like i need to do in my life at the same time you lose sort of like a sense of like day. Like I can't even believe it's almost American Independence Day. Mazel tov to you guys. <laughs> Karl Marx's Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844, published by the Soviet Marx-Engels-Lenin Institute in 1919, sees Marx critiquing classical political economists, Adam Smith, Jean-Baptiste Say, and other thinkers influential to the inception of capitalism and its philosophical groundings. He finds that economic thought has had absolutely no regard for understanding the dehumanizing toll capitalism has on most humans living underneath it. Halfway through, he articulates this disregard and its practical application. Political economy, despite its worldly and voluptuous appearance, is a true moral science, the most moral of all sciences. Self-renunciation, the renunciation of life and all human needs, is its principal thesis. The less you eat, drink, and buy books, the less you go to the theater, the dance hall, the public house, the less you think, love, theorize, sing, paint, fence, etc., the more you save, the greater becomes your treasure, which neither moths nor rusts will devour, your capital. The less you are, the less you express your own life, the more you have, i.e., the greater is your alienated life, the greater is the store of your estranged being. 
Everything which the political economist takes from you in life and humanity, he replaces for you in money and in wealth. And all the things which you cannot do, your money can do. It can eat and drink, go to the dance hall and the theater. It can travel. It can appropriate art, learning, the treasures of the past, political power. All this it can appropriate for you. It can buy all this. It is true endowment. Yet being all this, it wants to do nothing but create itself, buy itself. For everything else is after all its servant. And when I have the master, I have the servant and do not need his servant. All passions and all activity must therefore be submerged in avarice. The worker may only have enough for him to want to live and may only want to live in order to have that. Later on, he turns towards classical philosophy, particularly Hegel, whose conception of labor is fundamental to Marx's critique of political economy, but whose articulations of man's relationship with the state, with culture, society, and economy are left unhelpfully as being merely abstract, that man's mental processes will allow him to overcome this estrangement by finally rejecting the objective. Or something like that. I have no idea what the philosophical parts of this text actually mean. It's very dense. Marx wrote this text, which is so simultaneously complex and groundbreaking that I may never understand it, when he was like 25, 26. Of course this makes me feel like a failure. <laughs> of course I feel like I'm not smart enough, not productive enough. Of course I'm stuck in a loop between depression and anxiety and stress and moments of exuberance and happiness and arrogance. Probably Marx did too, somehow. There is something abstract about being a young adult, being newly admitted into the club of responsible thing doers, and feeling aggressively introspective about every aspect of your life. When you're around my age, for example, it's not hard to feel like COVID-19 took away pivotal years of your life, like you got screwed. Like there were these amazing moments waiting for you that were subsequently made to disappear and now you'll never have these fundamental moments, fundamental developments in your life that people are supposed to have. And we may well be right, but we have to be careful when we think this way. We are not main characters in a movie. We are not really embarking on an abstract journey of self-actualization where we undergo turmoil at the beginning, then reach that climactic middle point and then moralize our way into the happy ending. Your life isn't a book that had pages ripped out of it by a global crisis, or at least it isn't supposed to be. Your life is a book insofar as you were told to make it one in order for it to be sold for profit. Our romanticization of particular qualities of an ideal adulthood are tied to the same forces that make these qualities impossible to obtain. Time management skills are like conventional beauty features. We chase them because they allow us to be commodified more easily. We're never happy with them because that commodification inherently alienates them from us. You can't love your hair if you judge it based on its capital. As capitalism is based on the maximization of surplus value extraction, leading to the alienation of the laborer from their work, a capitalist society orients itself toward extracting as much surplus value as possible from all alienated things. This is what becoming an adult is like under capitalism. Because your time is alienated from you, not only through the hours you spend laboring, but through the hours you spend mediated through capital, through the bank loans you owe, through the services you subscribe to, through the commodities that you desire and peruse, you are, of course, looking for more out of it. You have invested it. And so, as a 21-year-old about to graduate college, or as a 25-year-old hungry artist, or as a 34-year-old rock star, you cannot help but feel like you don't have enough time. Unfortunately, like a moment of pure bliss or a profound relationship or a healthy mental state, time is something you cannot buy. With, with the present systems, like economic systems, because it, there's a material reality to it, we know we can't leave, like realistically, like we're, we're there we can shit talk Jeff Bezos and capitalism all we want, but we're going to make an ad revenue and we're going to order off of Uber Eats. It's going to be fairly like the same old thing. It's very hard to, to get out of these systems, especially when there is that material reality 
embedded in it and you're born into it. And it's this whole argument with like the social contract. Unabomber recently died and he's a good example of somebody who very much was uh, against the social contract for better or worse. But I think that your kind of emphasis on looking towards like younger movements and younger people, like I think I saw your video recently on on the Spider-Verse thing, I, that just came up like really recently. That's a very good example of looking towards minds that have the creative space still that aren't entirely embedded within the material reality of neoliberalism or, or these, these oppressive systems and can offer kind of solutions and kind of glimpses of hope if we, you know, nurture these minds and we like give them the space and discourse to be able to to do this. Like I like to think of the the story and I, and it's also brought up in a in elite capture of the emperor's new clothes where for anybody that doesn't know the story this emperor is basically convinced by this guy that the this new robe it's visible to everyone but it's only invisible to people that are stupid or like incompetent so he puts it on but the thing is there, there is no robe it's like a you know he's naked but he think he genuinely thinks that this this is going to work and so all of his servants are like really scared to say anything because if they say like oh you're not wearing a robe you're you're basically calling yourself stupid if you say them what the reality is you're going to be punished by the emperor possibly because these servants would know the social reality, the possibility of punishment from communication. And so he walks around the town and everybody's applauding him over his beautiful robe, which isn't there. And I think right there is some great commentary over just power structures in general. You know, there's no use of violence here. There's no use of explicit like aggression, but just how the system set up is such a large population could just celebrate this super stupid situation where this guy's prancing around naked. But then the story ends with this kid going, but he's not wearing anything. And I think that's a really good example of, of the utility of listening to younger people is uh, it's that idea of Zen mind, beginner's mind, where, you know, because of a lack of experience, sometimes you're able to enter into a more creative space. How do we retain that inner child while also not becoming frail, not becoming like unable to survive in adult life. I think ironically, you retain the inner child by like genuinely growing up and maturing, like not just like withholding things or kind of just like, uh, as you were saying, like hand waving things away that obviously conflicted with, you know, maybe when you were younger and maybe a bit more naive. And this would go back to like Camus and why I like Camus is, is it's confronting the absurd, like actually it, with the full lucidity and then nonetheless choosing this sort of, you know, it's an act of optimism. It's, it's an act of, you know, faith that things will nonetheless be okay and all right. And you are a part of this process, not like passively, like things will be okay. It's like, no, you, you know what to do. Like I, I always hated when I was growing up, like the idea of like ignorance is bliss. And I think that's at the root of a lot of infantilization and markets prey on that, especially like they, they really like, they pretty much just tell you like, oh, don't worry about it. Like just, you can just watch Netflix. You can just order food. You can just, you know, ha live your happy life and like in your bubble as somebody who stays away from the news in general, like you should still be informed about how things are. There's just better, less sensationalized sources. That's like a whole other thing. But as you grow up, you're brain is evolving and you're dealing with more complex information and so you have to constantly catch up with that like the world's getting more complicated you're getting more complicated and if you just if you just ignore it and if you just pretend that that's not the case there's a slim possibility that you could live your whole life in your little bubble and you'll be completely fine but there's a much higher chance that any one little thing could easily pop that bubble and you're going to have like a midlife crisis or like an existential crisis and it's going to be horrific so do you want a little bit of like pain every once in a while where you kind of accept that you're growing older, things change and that you could still nonetheless like enjoy life and do what you want to do? Or do you want to like have it all build up and then be super susceptible and super fragile to like any little thing in your life suddenly like shifting? You know, I, I just think the, the path of like maturation and developing yourself is, is a lot more fruitful for yourself and the world in general.
I hope you like my shirt. I didn't create it. I bought it with money that I got from wage labor years ago to look cool. What did I just do?